This evening on Hearth and Home, Origin guests talk are back, talking more on the Safety with Guests campaign. Norman of PIMS discusses education, the child's future, and the way forward. In a house and home kitchen, our best mom Miriam cooks up some best chunks of results. And for the agriculture lot, Bill Neal takes us through the Kubota range of products that are already available at Brian Bell. A very good evening to you all and welcome to House and Home. Hope everyone treated their mums for Mother's Day over the weekend. Those that are not with their mums but are able to call her, I hope you all made that all too special phone call home to her. There are those that would have lost their mums, but you still have every reason to celebrate Mother's Day as you would have celebrated her life and the legacy she would have left behind with you and within those that she may have had with a positive impact within their lives. Then of course, there are other members of your family who are mothers or mothers-to-be, so celebrating with them is also a great feeling. But don't stop there. Enjoy time with family and give your mothers, aunts, partners, sisters, etc. a break and treat them to a barbecue outdoors or enjoy a weekend activity of some sort, whether it be just relaxing or adventurous, just enjoy time out with family. Moving on, we now join Henry for the Origin Guest Talk segment, where he will demonstrate the correct ways of connecting your guests safely, and I will see you shortly. <laughs> Hello viewers, I am Henry Maipu and thank you once again for joining us on the third episode of Origin Guest Talk. Today, we're here in court in Port Mosby at the Origin House School. Just a brief recap on the last two segments on Origin Guest Talk. We covered the launching of the safety campaign, introducing the first eight blocks of awareness, which includes connecting your guests safely, how to safely transport your guests, lifting your guests safely, safety tips, tips on efficient burning, safe storage, cleaning your gas stove at home, and why you should cook with gas. Last week, we demonstrated to you reasons as to why it is more convenient to cook with gas compared to firewood, electricity, and kerosene. Using the kettle of water as a test subject, you saw for yourself that the use of firewood, kerosene, and electric stove does not heat up as fast, taking time to reach a required temperature to be able to cook or boil water and in most instances with the use of these appliances to cook within the kitchen cooking is slower as you saw gas is a faster way of cooking and it's hotter allowing instant cooking and it lasts longer our aim in all this is to educate our consumers bridge the fear factor that gas is dangerous and to encourage a safety culture within the home we strive to build consumer acceptance and confidence in using Origin Gas. In tonight's episode of the Origin Gas Talk, we take a look at one of the eight blocks of awareness of the safety campaign, connecting your guests safely. We'll be showing you steps and ways on how to connect the guests safely, as well as materials you will need to join a guest to a guest bottle. I will emphasize on maintaining standards on regulators and the different sizes of cylinders. We work with a 4.5 kg gas cylinder, a two banner cast iron stove, a 1.2 meter hose, a regulator already attached to the hose, and some soapy water. To safely connect, first of all, you will need to remove the safety plug from the cylinder. Secondly, attach the regulator to the cylinder. But before you do that, you will need to ensure that the regulator has an O-ring around the nozzle. Once you've confirmed that, then you insert the nozzle to the cylinder and to tighten, turn anti-clockwise. After connecting regulator to the cylinder, turn on the gas by turning the valve anti-clockwise. By now you have gas flowing through the hose and regulator. Now, how do you know or how do you check that your gas has been connected properly? In order to check or detect gas leaks, you will need to check all connections by using the soap water method. All you need is a small jug of water with added dishwashing detergent and simply pour it over the connection. If a leak exists, you will see a cluster of small bubbles appear. 
If that be the case, it is not recommended that you use the gas appliance. You would need to turn off the gas valve completely and disconnect the regulator. Once you've done that, phone our origin office to speak to experts for assistance or advice. Now to safely disconnect, follow these pointers. Always turn off cylinders when not in use. Ensure that cylinder valve is turned off. Now turn clockwise to disconnect your regulator from the cylinder. Make sure that the O-ring is still intact. And remember to keep cylinders upright and away from any source of heat. Hope those steps on connecting and disconnecting your gas cylinder to a banner or stove were simple enough to follow. If you missed some of that, you can log on to MTV website, www.mtv.com.pg to watch this particular segment again. Otherwise, please contact our origin office on details provided on your screen for flyers on tonight's topic. Thank you viewers for your time and be sure to join me on the next episode of Origin Gas Talk. We look at the safer ways for you to lift and carry gas cylinders. Also keep a lookout for Uncle Gasman appearance at your nearest Origin LP Gas dealer. And remember, LP Gas, life made easier. Have a good evening. Valuable advice there and in all seriousness, if you have done the test and still suspect that you have a leakage, please do not hesitate to call the Origin hotline and seek assistance. It's always good to be that extra cautious. After the break, we join Norman of Port Mosby Matriculation Studies. See you after these messages. Good evening viewers and welcome once again to this, the number 19th PIMS episode on House and Home. As you have seen, we have spent the last few episodes on the topic of English and for good reason. English is the language of all subjects, meaning success or failure in it will certainly and greatly determine success or failure in other subjects. It is no coincidence that students who score top marks in English also do very well in mathematics, science, and other subjects, more often than not. In our PNC context, attainment in English is so pivotal, crucial, and critical in the nowadays quite competitive tertiary and other selections, so much so that students cannot afford anything less than total and absolute commitment in the study of English. The future career, and indeed the entire life of many capable students can be ruined or derailed if poor attention and effort is given to the study of English while in school. A big factor that contributes to the lowering of English standards everywhere in the world is that young people read fewer books, newspapers and magazines compared to the past. So how do students perform in English across the country in PNG? As a snapshot or sample, I did some analysis and number crunching on the final grade 12 English or language and literature results of 2012. These are a few things I found. Number one, a total of 11,503 students from 108 secondary schools throughout PNG set for the grade 12 English language and literature exam of 2012. Number two, the breakdown of final grades awarded were as follows. 609 A's, representing 5% of those students. 2,525 B's were awarded, representing 22%. 4,559 C's representing 40%, 3,373 D's representing 29% of those students, and 559 E's were awarded representing 4% of those students. Number three, of the 609 A's that were awarded, 295 of them, or 48%, were awarded to NCD schools. The other 314 A's, or 52%, were awarded to the rest of the other schools in PNC. Number four, 10 schools scored three A's only, 13 schools scored two A's only, and 17 schools scored one A only. And number five, 27 schools did not score a single A in 2012. 
When I checked closely, these were mostly remote or rural, rural non-urban secondary schools. Let me hand over again to Mr. Bruce Copeland to continue talking about mastery learning in English at PIMS and the Norman CK Institute, NSI. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Thank you, Mr. Siki. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In recent weeks, I've talked about mastery learning. It's not just a technique of teaching a child to ride a bicycle. There is more than a single step in the process of education. Mastery learning in education is a very large strategy to teach students the total body of language, science, biology and mathematics. It involves hundreds of skills that need to be identified and categorised by topic and level of difficulty. To give all students the opportunity to understand, difficult learning areas have to be broken down into smaller parts. Each is presented as a problem exercise for students to solve. From earlier grades, the levels are not high. The students present the answer in their own words. This is the key to their growing skill in writing. Too often the students do not solve problems in Papua New Guinea, but they copy summaries from the blackboard. There is no thinking and no writing in their own words. In science, the grade four students may think of the following. This is very simple science. Why does a chicken fluff its feathers at night? Well, it does that to trap air that warms the body of the chicken. Where do chickens sleep at night? Baby chickens. They sleep under the mother. They sleep inside the, um, in, inside the, the air pocket within the feathers of the bird. Why do birds put their heads under their feathers? They do that to minimize loss of heat to their heads. Why do snakes sleep in the morning sun? Well, they are cold-blooded and they uh, have to heat their bodies. Do they sleep on rocks or logs? Well, they sleep on rocks because the rocks gather heat and they conduct heat to the body of the snake. Why do we put stones in a, in a muumuu? Well, the muumuu stones hold the heat and radiate the heat into the food. Why are cooking spoons made of wood? Well, they're made of wood because that prevents the heat burning our hands. In learning the basic practical understanding of science, students develop an extended sequence of knowledge, skills and integrated theory. Solving of problems comes first. The theory comes later. Above, we learn about conductors and insulators involved in retaining warmth of the body, heating on conductor stones rather than on insulating wood. But we use the same strategy in promoting writing skills. But this requires the students to be skilled in reading, writing, comprehension and expressing ideas in their own words. Young students learn to put sentences together in connected patterns in the same way that we teach biology. In the last week, I showed you a sequence of patterns, but there was no time to explain that there are basic rules in writing. Words should not be unnecessarily repeated. Baby talk consists of mindless repetition of words. I live in a village. It is a small village. It is a village on the river. I have a brother. I have a sister. My brother and sister go to school. I go to school. I am in grade six. Sentences should be combined with subject and verb removed from the subordinate sentences. Words but, and, and with are key connectors. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. The birds were singing. This becomes, it was a beautiful day with the sun shining and birds singing. Was was removed as in was shining as well as the birds. We've taken the out because it's been repeated. Participles having, looking, traveling and hundreds more can connect parts of a sentence. 
A change in a sentence may require small adjustments elsewhere in the sentence. He looked out the window. He saw a ship. It was on the horizon. Becomes looking out the window. He saw a ship on the horizon. Students start in grade six at the age of 12 to 14 years old. Their capacity to think is starting to grow. They can think more and more in the abstract. They can express reasoned argument. Students start to look outside their village and examine issues relating to the nation and the world. They learn about pollution, environment, war, and problems of national development. Now the complexity of their written English and reading has to rise. Students will suffer if they have no access to newspapers and books in the home. If students are to succeed at higher grades, they need to increase their knowledge and explain complex ideas in more complex words and sentences. They need to have laid the foundation from elementary school to grade five and grade six. They should end that time with knowledge of hundreds of words. It is the teacher's job to assist students to compile spelling lists and practice skill in words with spelling tests. It is good to hear reports from people in the nation that the education system should go back to teaching spelling by phonics. I taught my daughters to read at the age of five by putting spelling lists and silly sentences on computer. That is how Dr. Seuss taught a generation of children to read in the 1960s. We all know the book, The Cat in the Hat, but I gave my children words like cat, mat, hat, bat, rat, fat, sat, pat, can, ran, fan, man, van, tan, and then we went into silly sentences like Dr. Seuss. The fat man sat on the tall hat. What a silly sentence. The man ran to the van with a can. See the funny bunny hit the sad man. I sit on the tall wall with a small ball. Students will be ready for higher writing and reading if they are skilled in sounding words, decoding and using extended vocabulary Spelling lists need to come back so that by the age of 15 years, students should know the spelling and forms of 1,500 words. The key to mastery writing is the ability to write in own words, not just copy from a book or from the blackboard. At higher levels of learning, this becomes known as plagiarism. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Mr. Siki. Thank you, Mr. Copeland, for another interesting and informative discussion of mastery learning in English that can be used in the teaching and learning of English that can further enrich students. In closing, the brief analysis of the 2012 Grade 12 English results sets NCD well and truly apart from the rest of the country. They have exposure to TV, internet, better facilities, resources, teachers, and the list goes on. The 27 secondary schools who could not manage a single A, that represents exactly 25% or a quarter of all the secondary schools that set for the grade 12 language and literature exam in 2012. I think that is far too many underperforming schools for our liking or comfort. Since attainment in English remains the crucial yardstick, for tertiary selections, students in remote schools and provinces will continue to have their dreams and aspirations shattered or denied for as long as conditions and capacity does not allow them to excel and compete. Such provinces will continue to have minimal or no representation in our most important higher learning institutions for extended periods of time. The implications for them are obvious. The ball is well and truly in the courts of these provinces. Once again, I thank all of you for your attention tonight. A big thank you yet again to Mr. Bruce Copeland for joining us and continuing to inform and motivate us on mastery learning in English. 
I am sure students would be most interested to know more about the hundreds of sentence and writing patterns that he has been presenting. Till we meet again in two weeks time for another PIMS episode, it's good night to you all. Have a safe and good week. Thank you. I hope most of our scholars and students out there paid attention to what they've just aired, and it is quite true that English is the language of all subjects. Over the years, we have witnessed slang and what I call English shortcut creeps into the system and disrupt the flow of learning in English classes. This isn't any one particular school. It's pretty much all schools nationwide. I have met a couple of English teachers and they've shared their stories on how at the start of one school year, they had given a one-page essay for their students to write so they have a better feel and understanding of a level each student were at and to identify their weaknesses. Upon marking, they were shocked with some of the essays they read through, as quite a number of them had used SMS abbreviations, incorrect spelling on some pretty basic or simple words, and a couple used slang phrases such as sick instead of amazing or awesome, and if I remember correctly, two other slang phrases used to describe something radical was wicked and fat, spelled P-H-A-T. It took these two teachers a while to figure out what they meant. They ended up handing back those essays and told each of those students to rewrite their entire essay in English using the correct English, and they had to do that after school. One of the two teachers went on further to test the student's level of English and got each one to read half a page each of a novel. She was fortunate that she had enough copies to go around of the same novel. Some students read well, while a number of them struggled badly, even on pronouncing basic words correctly. She then identified these students as the, the same students that wrote those poor essays. The point I'm making here, though we have advanced considerably in technology, and the generation today are born into this era, they are also easily prone to some of the bad habits of social media. We as adults need to take responsibility as well as ensure that our children are exposed to educational type programs as well as read books more to help them improve on their level of English. More on House and Home in a moment. See you shortly. Welcome back. Now I'm going to talk on a topic that will hopefully answer the one question that has been asked by many women, moms, housewives, or men that just simply enjoy cooking every time they go out shopping to purchase a bottle of oil. And I'm almost certain that some may have been asked by their own children, and it's either you don't have an answer or just simply make one up to avoid looking silly. If you're one that frequently does the cooking at home, then you are probably familiar with using oil. Cooking oil, that is, which is used as an ingredient for recipes or mostly used for frying. One of the most common cooking oil that most, if not all, households are very familiar with is vegetable oil. Even though it says vegetable oil, but what is vegetable oil? What makes up vegetable oil? You walk into a shop and on the shelf are a number of different types of oils. I tend to hear a great deal the question asked by a shopper. What's the difference? Well, I'm going to explain in brief the different types of oils available on your supermarket shelves. What oils are best used for frying, the proper use of each oil, and the best way to store oil. I'll start with the vegetable oil. Vegetable oil is probably the most commonly used of all the oils. As mentioned earlier, it can be used in recipes, but it's mainly used for frying. Vegetable oil is actually a blend of several oils, such as corn, soybean, palm, and sunflower. One other oil that's become a frequent user in a number of households is canola oil. Canola oil is known to be one of the most healthy of the cooking oils because of its low saturated fat content and high monounsaturated fat. What is saturated fat? Putting it very simply, it's the fatty acids that can contribute in weight gain. These fats are also found in cream, cheese, butter, and fatty meats, for example. 
too much if the saturated fat can lead to a number of health problems. Monounsaturated fat is a healthier fatty acid. Canola oil is commonly used in frying, but it's best used in medium frying temperatures, such as pan frying, not so much for barbecues. Then there's corn oil. Corn oil is relatively low on both saturated and monounsaturated fats. It is popular in margarines and can be used in both frying and baking. Like the canola oil, corn oil should be used when frying in medium temperatures. Also on the supermarket shelves, you'll find sunflower oil. Sunflower oil is low in saturated fat and high in vitamin E. Many food manufacturers are recognizing the health benefits of sunflower oil and are using it as the preferred oil in such snack foods as potato chips. It can also be used in home to fry, general cooking and also used in salad dressings. The olive oil. Now the olive oil is in my favorite of all oils and one I tend to use a great deal in my kitchen. There are different varieties of olive oil, extra virgin, virgin, extra light and refined. Extra virgin oil is the most common of those used. There are many uses for all varieties, such as stir frying, cooking, sauteing, and as an ingredient in recipes. Olive oil is also frequently used in salad oils. It is the most healthy of all the oils as it is high on monounsaturated fat, which has been shown to help reduce the risk of heart disease. Many people use it daily in their meals, drizzling it over a wide variety of foods. The last oil on my list found commonly on supermarket shelves is peanut oil. Peanut oil is a great oil to use when frying in high temperatures. In some foreign countries, it is a common oil used during Thanksgiving as many homes would use in their turkey fryers to fry their turkeys. But I find peanut oil as the best oil to use during barbecues and it can be used any time when frying is required at very high temperatures. Now let's talk on storing oil. All oil remain liquid when kept at room temperatures, so it is best to store oil in a dark, dry place such as your pantry if you have one or your kitchen cupboard. Oils that are high in monounsaturated fat will keep up to a year, while refined olive oil having the highest of the monounsaturated fat can last a few years. Extra virgin and virgin olive oils will keep about a year after open. The shelf life of most other oils after opens is usually six to eight months. Another important fact to note is how to properly discard used cooking oil. It should never be poured down your kitchen sink. Oil can congeal and block pipes. The best way to discard of it is to pour it into a leak-proof container and discard it with the rest of your garbage. Now that you are more knowledgeable about cooking oils, the different types of cooking oils available and its best uses, you can shop easy with the understanding and decide for yourself which is better for you. Happy shopping! We'll be back with more on House and Home in a moment. Good evening and welcome to another Brian Bell segment on House and Home. I'm your host for the evening, Bill Neal. Tonight we take a look at a new product that has joined the ranks of Brian Bell. All the way from Japan, Brian Bell brings you Kubota. The Kubota Corporation of Japan was established in 1890 and has become an international brand leader with a focus on contributing to society by offering environmentally compatible equipment designed to improve quality of life. Definitely sounds like a Brian Bell product to me. It's like I say, Brian Bell has quality products because it has quality suppliers. In 1969, Kubota began exporting its 21 horsepower L200 to the United States. Because of the initial success in the American marketplace, the Kubota Tractor Corporation was formed. 
Since then, Kubota has won industry awards, environmental awards, the list goes on. The Kubota Corporation has subsidiaries and affiliates that manufacture and market products that are sold in more than 130 countries. Papua New Guinea is now one of those countries. Let's meet the Kubota tractors and learn about their different features. These tractors have a lot of the same features because uniformity is important. It makes it easier for Kubota users to go from one tractor to another because the features are kept the same. The difference is in the use of the tractors. Different tractors are better suited for different end users. A particular attachment will suit different tasks better. So that's where uniformity of Kubota features come in handy. For instance, the levers are all the same color coding all the way through the Kubota range. This means you can transfer your learned skills to another Kubota tractor. If you operate one Kubota tractor, it's highly likely that you could operate others and with this comes the benefits. The first machine that we'll take a look at is the B3300. It's a 33 horsepower, four-wheel drive tractor which has hydrostatic transmission. A hydrostatic tractor is one that uses hydraulic drive propulsion system in place of the standard clutch and gear transmission. The benefit of this lies in the tractor's ability to provide continually variable speeds without the need to clutch and shift gears. By simply moving the hand lever or pushing the foot on the pedal, the tractor's speed and torque can be adjusted on the fly. This allows the operator to vary the tractor's performance while not having to stop. By continuing to move forward or backward while adjusting to traction conditions, the tractor is less likely to become stuck. Various attachments are available with these Kubota tractors. The B3300 can be fitted with a front-end loader, standard 4-in-1 bucket, a slasher, plow and tip trailers. The three-point linkage at the back of the tractor makes it safe and easy to attach and detach all these accessories. As you can see, with this range of attachments, the B3300 is versatile and can be suitable for vegetable growers, subsistence farmers, local level government, airstrip maintenance, rice growers, chicken farmers, options are endless. This is the M7040SU. The M stands for manual transmission. It has eight gears and is suitable for the bigger farmer or user that has more to move faster. You can fit it with a front-end loader and make it into a versatile piece of equipment. But what you currently see attached are the counterweights so that when you're digging or lifting, you have enough weight to complete your task. The M7040SU is perfect for road construction, airport maintenance, rubber or oil palm plantations, local level government, department of works, and I'm sure you can think of many more uses. Its size and versatility make it ideal machinery for a wide variety of end users. Right, this is some of the equipment. This is a disc plough, which will fit the different models for the various tractor sizes. This one here, a three disc plough, will probably fit the L4400. There's a three disc plough to suit the bigger tractor and smaller ploughs for the other tractors. The machine behind it is a disc harrow, which is all, this. so this is your primary cultivation and this is for your second. So you plough your ground first with this one and then your second to make it nice to plant your crop, you use that machine there. You can use a rotary hoe. You can just say that you can see where the man's walking. That was cut in one pass with this tractor and the slasher. So you can get your rough country under control. The B2320 is a 20 horsepower tractor. It's similar to the B3300 except smaller. The added feature here is the midpoint PDO, which is found beneath the tractor near the shaft. You can attach a mower to the midpoint PDO and convert this into a ride-on mower, perfect for universities, sports grounds, or the botanical gardens for that matter. The RTV900 is a great piece of equipment that is two-wheel and four-wheel drive, has three ranges in gears and reverse, can be fitted with a screen and wipers, depending on your use. It's a comfortable two-seater and comes with a tip tray to make it a very useful piece of equipment. Good for transporting heavy equipment around work sites, mine sites or farms. It's heavy duty, good range of gears and versatile. This is the L4600. It is a 46 horsepower tractor fitted with rotors and can also accommodate Kubota's full range of attachments. It pulls a two disc plow which makes it suitable for medium sized farming operations, cocoa, coffee or coconut. It can pull a two-ton trailer. Just connect it to the tractor. It's very easy to drive. Just click into gear and you're off. These attachments fit onto the tractor through the three-point linkage, which can be found at the back of the tractor. The L4400 is a three-disc plow for when size matters. There are a range of plows to fit and suit each Kubota tractor. 
These three disc plows are excellent for the Asia Pacific market because they are very effective against tonai grass and will still toil the soil, till the land and make hard work easy. Kubota attachments allow users to 1. cultivate the land and 2. break down the soil. A new concept with Kubota tractors are multi-disc harrows, used to break down the soil. Rotary tillers and hoes give you the finish you require. Kubota attachments are as follows. You got your primary, secondary, rotary tiller, slasher. This slasher has metal chains instead of rubber and leaves a desirable finish for certain jobs. Take for instance you rolled soil until it's even and dry. Using this slasher will leave an even finish with no markings on the soil. Models sold by Brian Bell are also sold in Australia, which gives you the added benefit of service support coming from Australia, which is a lot closer than coming from Turkey or Brazil, India or China. Other tractors source their spare parts and accessories from these faraway countries, whereas if you own a Kubota and are experiencing any problems, Australia is, in comparison, a stone's throw away. There you have it folks, quality products sold at Brian Bell. We stock spare parts and service our tractors. Our Kubota products are supported by Australian Kubota dealers. In Papua New Guinea, we know the importance of agriculture to our economy. The government has made it easier for Papua New Guineans to own small to medium businesses to target the agricultural sector, amongst others. These Kubota tractors are the right size for the PNG market. Whether it be for business or individuals, these Kubota tractors are a small, medium or large size with attachments that make them relevant to many settings and applicable to many uses. If you're going to buy a tractor, buy a Kubota. I've told you why. They are the right size for our market, applicable to many uses, quality backed products that will not let you down. Our Mother's Day competition is still on. 50 Kina gets you in the running to win some very cool prizes, with the nationwide draw prize being the draw card for the competition. Have you visited your mother lately? Brian Bill gives you that opportunity if you shop with us. But why not? Because great products, great prices. That's Brian Bell. See you all next week. Good night. Best price, best quality. Guaranteed at Brian Bell. Right on, right on, Mr. B. After the break, we join our Besta mom, Miriam, in the house and home kitchen for cooking with Besta, making Besta chunks results. See you soon. It's the tastiest tuna in a can. It's the new Besta Tuna Chunks in 185 grams. Packed with 100% premium white meat goodness. The finest export quality tuna is now available nationwide in oil and brine. Besta Tuna Chunks and Bestia. Proudly PNG made. Good night, everyone. Welcome once again and thank you for watching another program of Cooking with Besta. My name is Miriam and tonight's recipe is Besta Tuna Chunk Risole. This recipe is very easy, quick, and simple. All you have to do is prepare one tablespoon of sweet chili, one tablespoon of soy sauce, salt, a quarter cup of tomato sauce, one tablespoon of sour cream, two tablespoons of olive oil, a quarter cup of grated cheese, plain flour to coat, 125 grams of corn kernels, one egg lightly beaten, half cup of breadcrumbs, one zucchini, one and a half cup of rice, and two times canned besta tuna chunks in 185 grams. Besta tuna chunks comes in three types, the besta tuna chunks in oil and the besta tuna chunks in brine. These two products are pure white meat, which are exported internationally. And the best are tuna flakes in oil. We will firstly pour in the best are tuna chunks. Followed by the rice. zucchini breadcrumbs egg
the corn. Grated cheese. Sour cream. Tomato sauce. Pinch of salt. Soy sauce. And a sweet chili sauce. When all the ingredients are combined, we mix thoroughly all the ingredients. Mix the ingredients slowly until all are combined well. Once you see that the mixture is well combined, okay, we will refrigerate for 10 minutes. Okay viewers, our Besta Tuna Chunk Rissoles is now ready. We will remove from the refrigerator. As you can see, now our Besta Tuna Chunk Rissoles is ready to make different shapes. After making the Rissoles into balls, you coat it inside the flour so that your risole won't get stuck in the pan. Add into the frying pan. You can create many shapes out of these risoles. You can make as many balls as you want. Then the risole, make sure it's golden brown. Okay, I think our risole is ready. We remove from the pan. After serving the rice onto the plate, you can now add in the Besta Tuna Chunk Risole. You can also add the tomatoes for coloring. And also chips. Okay, viewers, this is the Besta Tuna Chunk Risole. You can purchase your Besta Tuna Chunks in oil, Besta Tuna Chunks in brine, and the Besta Tuna Flakes in oil at your nearest supermarket. Thank you and hope to see you again in the next. Cooking with Besta program. It's better, it's Besta. Pride of PNG. It's the tastiest tuna in a can. It's the new Besta tuna chunks in 185 grams. Packed with 100% premium white meat goodness. The finest export quality tuna is now available nationwide in oil and brine. Besta tuna chunks and Bestia. Proudly PNG made. Another great simple recipe and will no doubt be a favorite for the children, especially to have for lunch, dinner, or a simple after-school snack. See you after these messages.
Next week on House and Home, Dr. Ambi joins us for more on mental health. We are tuned in mixing rice salad on cooking with Besta. We welcome National Development Bank to the show, taking up in finance upkeeping. And for more great quality products, we join Bill Neal over at Brian Bell once again. We've pretty much come to the end of the show. This is where I'm going to leave you. Once again, continue in making this year a fitness year and eat healthy, exercise regularly, get into the habit of enjoying the outdoor more, and just keep on moving. Until next week, from the House and Home crew and myself, have a pleasant evening. Good night.